rhythms passed down to us through ancient spirits. Feel the spirit, a unifying force. Come on, move with the spirit. From WSNC 90.5, a broadcasting service and NPR affiliate of Winston-Salem State University, welcome to Africa World Now Project. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. Today, Latin America and the pitfalls of national consciousness. Africa World Now Project is next. History teaches us clearly that the battle against colonialism does not run straight away along the lines of national. For a very long time, the native devotes his energies to ending certain definite abuses, forced labor, corporal punishment, inequality of salaries, limitation of political rights, etc. This fight for democracy against the oppression of mankind will slowly leave the confusion of neoliberal universalism to emerge, sometimes laboriously, as a claim to nationhood. It so happens that the unpreparedness of the educated classes, the lack of practical links between them and the masses of the people, their laziness, and let it be said, their cowardice at the decisive moment of the struggle will give rise to tragic mishaps. National consciousness, instead of being the all-embracing crystallization of the innermost hopes of the whole people, instead of being the immediate and most obvious result of the mobilization of the people, will be in any case only an empty shell, a crude and fragile travesty of what it might have been. The pitfalls of national consciousness is one of the many important theoretical contributions from Franz Fanon. Fanon argues that nationalism often fails at achieving liberation across class boundaries because its aspirations are primarily those of the colonized bourgeoisie. A privileged middle class who perhaps seeks to defeat the prevailing colonial rule only to usurp its place of dominance and surveillance over the working class, the lumpen proletariat. With the current discourse around limited notions of nationalism and the so-called rise of an ultra-nationalist global right, today's program is an intentional disruption in this milieu. It is designed to offer streams of thought that invoke critique and inform paths of study towards solutions. Today's conversation attempts to offer perspective by focusing specifically on the socio political and cultural conditions in Brazil, Venezuela, and Cuba. What you will hear next is a recent conversation with James Early. James Early is a former director of cultural studies and communication at the Center for Folklife Programs and Cultural Studies at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Mr. Early has served in various positions at the Smithsonian Institution, including Assistant Provost for Educational and Cultural Programs, Assistant Secretary for Education and Public Service, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Service, and Executive Assistant to the Assistant Secretary for Public Service. Prior to his work with the Smithsonian, Mr. Early was a humanist administrator at the National Endowment for the Humanities in Washington, D.C., a producer, writer, and host of 10 Minutes Left, a weekly radio segment of cultural, educational, and political interviews and commentary at WHUR-FM Radio at Howard University, and a research associate for programs and documentation. He currently serves on the board of the Institute for Policy Studies and is a consultant on various issues related to human rights, labor, land, and statecraft. Today's program was produced in solidarity with the native, indigenous, African, and Afro-descendant communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Brazil, Colombia, Kenya, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Palestine, South Africa, and Ghana, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Enjoy the program. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, James Early. How are you? I'm doing good, and I'm pleased to be with you at this very uh, important um, moment about topics which we will pursue. And it is a very interesting moment indeed. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the global so-called rise of the ultra-right, and I say so-called because I think it's important to contextualize a lot of the conversations that have been going on specifically in, in Latin America in relation to Brazil, the current situation in Brazil, but also Venezuela and Cuba. And we've been hearing this, you know, this notion of nationalism. We've been hearing a notion of ultra-right. We've been hearing militarization. 
and all of these particular uh, factors that have been involved in the current situations that are going on in Latin America, but of course that is extended to Europe and other places um, as well. But let's contextualize our conversation a little bit. The ideas of Fanon become important as a frame of reference to understanding this conceptualization of nationalism. And also, I think that it's important to situate or frame this this conversation that we're having about the politics, uh, the sociopolitical conditions and the cultural situation in Latin America, specifically in Brazil, Venezuela, and, and Cuba. Let's contextualize this. In Brazil, this idea of a, of a rainbow democracy, this notion and this rise of this, uh, the, the current um, elected president has spurred a lot of conversation um, globally. How do we understand the rise, the so-called rise, of Bolsonaro to become elected president in Brazil? Uh, very important uh, questions. I think we, we must step back to um, look at the history of Latin America, uh, the Americas in general, but Latin America in particular, um, with regard to the uh, maturation of uh, capitalism and what is generally referred to uh, as a result of the Atlantic slave trade, but it was a European Atlantic slave trade in which um, tens of millions of enslaved Africans were taken into Latin America, in particular by way of contrast with less than a half million uh, enslaved Africans being brought to the United States, uh, in contrast to uh, about a million or so enslaved Africans being taken into Cuba, uh, the mouth of the Caribbean, the largest republic, and the interconnectedness of the um, economic exploitation and extraction of resources from all the way from the Philippines and certainly from across uh, Latin America, Brazil, Peru, Mexico, other places, being sent back out through Cuba. So there is this historical uh, geopolitical uh, context in which the issue of of race and issues of nationalism emerges. Uh, Latin America today, as a result of this super exploitation and accumulation of capital, is the most unequal uh, class divide uh, in the world, the sharpest class divide in the world. Uh, represented in Brazil, the sixth, seventh largest economy in the world, with uh, officially over 51% of its population being Afro descent. Uh, showing the highest indices of misery, uh, poverty, incarceration, the subjects of um, murder and assassination by the use of official violence of the police, being subjugated in their communities by the use of military forces uh, as a complement to that of um, uh, ordinary uh, police. And so that we have seen uh, in the last, since 1999, more or less, uh, that Latin America went into uh, rebellion. This was the objective circumstance of trying to take control of the nation state on the part of the most marginalized and dispossessed uh, with politicians seeking radical um, uh, economic, social, and political alternatives. Of course, Cuba in 1959 uh, sets the pivot and therein the popularity of Cuba, even with those who disagree with uh, socialism. Um, and so that uh, that movement on the part of popular um, democratic governments uh, coming out of the dictatorship of Brazil in uh, the 1980s, after many, many years of uh, dictatorship, of Operation Condor used by the CIA and the elites of those countries to disappear, uh, murder, uh, and kidnap the children of uh, left-wing dissidents who, working with popular organizations, were in rebellion against these egregious economic circumstances. Uh, that sets the context then of the re-emergence, uh, vulgarly, vilely, of a right wing, particularly in Brazil, than the Bolsonaro, which makes very clear that this is about European Brazilian males, uh, no women in his cabinet, no blacks or indigenous people in his cabinet, his sexist statements, his uh, uh, overt racist comments and attack on black people uh, as being uh, not even uh, of value to reproduce. Uh, these vulgar, vile, reflections are an attempt to take back against those who have fought against the, the inequality. Now, this has to be put in a global context because there is indeed a very conscious organization across nations of right-wing civil society and also of right-wing 
uh, political parties that are consciously and openly uh, connected. So with the emergence of Bolsonaro, uh, Steve Bannon, who is a major strategist traveling the entire world, uh, connecting um, the fascism that has emerged in the United States, that is the authoritarianism, the ultranationalism, the racism, the sexism, the anti-immigration policies, uh, is connected to uh, the right wing around Brexit in Europe. Uh, is uh, Bol- He was with Bolsonaro and helped to pioneer the social media uh, rise of the popularity and fund- among fundamentalist Christians in Brazil. And so that we must see this not only in national terms, but in Uh, transnational terms that uh, the global right wing and certain parts of finance capital, which would prefer to have uh, less vulgar, less blatant exploitation, but will cede themselves to the bourgeois democratic will of voters who vote them in. This is the context in which we, I think, must look at the issues of nationalism. Uh, I think we must also then step back and see that in the independent struggle against European colonization uh, in Latin America, Brazil uh, being the largest of those countries, the issues of um, the Grand Colombia with uh, Simon Bolivar, who freed five countries, um, what is today Panama, Colombia, uh, Venezuela, uh, Peru, that these nationalists uh, talked about uh, a national liberation struggle, but really they were just simply trying to become uh, the, the top class and to replace the colonial domination and uh, they did not have a plan. They were not for the most part interested in working with the masses of the people. And this is Fanon's point. Uh, Fanon's point is that a true nationalism uh, would be one that submits itself to the needs and the will and the active participation of the marginalized, the out- outcast, the exploited. And so these, these are the contradictions that over historical time are now evolving in terms of uh, the struggle to reclaim the nation uh, on the, in relationship to the masses of the people, to constructs of participatory democracy, the search for alternatives, a 21st century pluralism, a, a socialism plural in Latin America. That's some of the very important points that you made, and I wanted to pull on a couple of these points, but I wanted to go back to this idea of the super exploitation and global capital and its direct relationship to the natural resources to these particular countries that we're talking about. And also, as you mentioned in your closing just now or in your last statement, of recapturing the state and how all of this was in the environment or in the in the context of also the a certain class in nationalist movement, I mean, I'm sorry, in, in independence movements who were giving uh, just a, a facade of working with the people. And in this particular 21st century, this idea of capitalism and being built off of the natural resources and these natural resources are having a direct impact on the climate are having a reverberation in the in the loosening or the loosening of grip of those who are in power. Would you? Well, um, I'm 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 not sure about the loosening of the grip of those uh, in 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 power. I mean, we've seen that most of these um, nations, the um, the intellectual class and the the petty bourgeois class, uh, the those who had uh, advanced education under uh, colonial empires, emerged not with ideas of becoming a true national bourgeoisie and relationship to the needs of the masses of their citizens, but emerged in large measure to replace those uh, colonial uh, rulers, uh, colonial governorships um, and the like on the continent of Africa or in the case of Latin America, who had theretofore uh, dominated them. They had all of the pro forma dimensions of uh, national flags and national anthems, and they accrued a certain amount of uh, personal uh, resources, as Fanon points out, that were not invested in controlling the economy and the interests of their citizens, but were deposited into international banks and the construction of large houses and big cars and, um, in his term, dolling up the, uh, the wives of many of the male leaders. We still see that uh, very rampant 
in the soup exploitation, for example, in Brazil of a kind of gangsterism, uh, capitalism uh, that simply discards working people and is interested in finance capital, the global gambling game in which there are, there are very little productive uh, dimensions in terms of improving the quality of life of citizens uh, comes out of that. And they form in it uh, an ideology, an outlook, a popular ideology um, among masses of people and nations about that they are members of a nation and that if these upper classes, to the extent that they succeed, somehow the nation is succeeding. Uh, this is sort of the false consciousness which results in um, masses of exploited people. We saw most recently in Brazil significant numbers of Afro-Brazilians um, who are in the grips of fundamentalist Christianity uh, voted for Bolsonaro. The, um, the issues of crime in which uh, the national bourgeoisie has not provided uh, sufficient opportunities for education and for the security of people, and so people resort uh, to other means, um, and the fear then runs through the society, and ordinary people are separated from their communities by the propaganda that uh, voting for a strong anti-democratic hand will literally uh, um, um, protect them. So these are some of the contradictions in the, around the national question uh, from the vantage point of different classes and different races. You know, Fanon points out in the pitfalls of uh, nationalism that uh, these hollow formulas about nationalism can easily resort to people raising race over a wholesome nation or raising tribe over a wholesome nation. And so that we also see um, many of these dimensions in which, for example, in Brazil, many black people don't see themselves in, in the form of the state of being uh, part of the leadership of the state to the extent that they demand democracy it's as a separate community. And it's from an anti-racist perspective. It's not from a pro-strategy of development perspective. We see that across including in the United States, where uh, many people embolden themselves from a needed anti-racist position, but not from the position of how racism is tied up in the social relations of production. And then they're in the need to have see themselves in terms of a nationalism that would not just be subjects of change, but would be actors of change, would be in the leadership, not only for their particular race or their particular gender, but for the nation as a whole. And actually, we want to pivot and talk about those movements, those movements that are that are led by uh, people like Mariela Franco and, and, and women in Brazil um, that are pushing these ideas of a different nationalism or a different idea of freedom or, or a different conceptualization of how the how the state should be formed. And, and let's talk about some of the important, maybe we can look at some historical, but then move forward, some of the important Afro-Brazilian um, leaders who were espousing or expressing a diversion conceptualization of what the state should look like or what it should be doing for the people. You know, Brazil is, is, uh, is a big, it's a very complex example, and I've been traveling to Brazil um, for about 44, 45 years, and uh, a Portuguese speaker, and have had opportunity to engage with a lot of different sectors, uh, both from the ordinary citizens to the more consciously organized citizenry um, through groups like Gelades, um, a Yoruba term uh, for strong black religious women, uh, which I sort of refer to as the National Council of Negro Women in a general construct in Brazil, are uh, with uh, CONAIN, the, the coordination of um, black entities across the country, which is a bit more um, left in its perspective and transformative about the nature of, this, of the system. And also in recent years, being a bit closer to the movement of landless people. And um, Brazil has a uh, a real serious underdevelopment of the majority of the population, which is the black population, with very, by way of comparison, few educated people, lawyers, doctors, people involved in commerce or, or industry, uh, so that they are not in a position with the sort of bourgeois capitalist nation to really have major impact. There's certainly a lot of individual development of people with education, affirmative action has provided uh, a lot of that. But what gets obscured in Brazil is, as I think in all republics in the Americas, is the racialized nature of class. So I recently was informed after 
having raised open criticism in my engagement for a number of years with the Movement for Landless People, which I saw as a very progressive, um, perhaps the most um, developed civil society organization in the world from a radical transformative perspective, I did not see many black people there. And I recently was informed that maybe as much as 60% of their cadre are black, but they are up in the northeastern part of Brazil, uh, not down in the southern agricultural uh, uh, areas of, of Brazil. So we had to take a, a closer look at what the national question means. Um, the issue of race is still, unfortunately, tragically, by radical transformers who are not black, uh, seen as a kind of secondary uh, question. You'll hear more about indigenous people uh, in Latin America, unfortunately, than you will hear about uh, the over half the population of Brazil, which uh, is 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 black. Um, many black Brazilians, I would even say most black Brazilians that I come into contact with, uh, don't engage uh, the left transformative perspectives about taking control of the state. Um, as Fanon pointed out in Pitfalls of of Nationalism. Uh, they are more focused on the egregious issues of exploitation, food, clothing, shelter, housing, security, but not seeing it in a, in a kind of systemic way. So the ideological battle uh, needs to occur on both sides with regard to black people, that the fundamental question of democracy in Brazil is tied up fundamentally with the black population. And therefore, they have to have a perspective of being on the commanding heights of where the nation goes, not just uh, how they fend off uh, the egregious issues that they face uh, as a racialized community, but that they have to see themselves as as a transformative element of a new kind of nation, as a part of uh, that leadership, not as a secondary element. Uh, I had a recent discussion in the last year uh, with a leading activist whose name I will not call but is globally known, black activists in Brazil. Uh, when we, Danny Glover and I were there, we were uh, meeting uh, with Landis people and we insisted that we also meet with black activists. The response that I got is, we're neither left nor right. And that s sort of neutrality or that sort of false independence that the black community can go its own way uh, redounds to the dominant class uh, because the great majority of the citizenry are not involved in confronting the systemic issues that that dominant class is dealing with. And you mentioned, the, you know, this idea of the national question, but you also uh, mentioned the landless movement, which I wanted to kind of unwrap and see how the question of land fits into these particular um, questions of nationalism, but uh, these questions of identity, these questions of um, also the idea of formulating a state, um, an equal um, nation state. And this question of land is very, very important because I know your work on this particular question, particularly in Latin America, is very important. And can you can you talk a little bit more, you know, that particular work and how that question, uh, how the land question is very important in this conversation as well? Well, all of the countries of the South, I mean, generally the, the agricultural areas were uh, northern industrial countries. They became industrial countries through the super exploitation and accumulation of capital uh, from the rape and pillage of the southern agricultural countries left. Um, practically all of these countries with a, a, a very small educated class, uh, no infrastructure. Uh, we will remember in the case of the Portuguese being defeated on the continent of Africa, they ripped out the plumbing in hotels and in offices. And uh, there were very few uh, educated black Africans uh, who could address those basic necessities. So the dependency uh, is still being uh, played out of that not only super accumulation of extracting uh, natural resources and the, the labor um, of people in Africa or in Latin America, uh, but also not providing the education, uh, as Fanon pointed out, where uh, they did not have the scientific uh, training uh, to, to be knowledgeable about their own nat natural resources or to take control of those natural resources or to build uh, new modes of industry that would be in the interest of the people. 
that's still being played out in places like Brazil because of the lack of, of education. So that a lot of uh, false consciousness, you know, we get a lot of people in the humanities writing books and doing research and talking about dance and religion and um, ideological outlooks, but being able to, being prepared to take control of the state and to collaborate uh, with a proactive citizenry on um, finding water, uh, developing housing. Um, these are questions, these are the solid questions of nationalism rather than the pro forma questions of saying that I am from a particular nation or, or that we are uh, in an anti position and battling uh, those in control and seeing that as the only virtue. The issue is transformation, not just resistance. And so that this is a, a challenge um, that I would say we've got to take up not only in Brazil. I've had this discussion in, in Colombia and in where uh, there is great consensus in what people are against. But in terms of being involved in taking control of the direction of the nation state, there is a lot of unease. There's a lot of inverted racialism that these are white people, we are black people, and so to never the twain. Uh, uh, shall meet. The question of race in Cuba, uh, uh, the Communist Party has admitted in Cuba that it was uh, a, a taboo, their term, uh, that uh, they saw it as a splitting question as they were facing uh, the imperial aggression of the United States just 90 miles away. And uh, they are recognizing, many of them, that that was a mistake, because if you don't target uh, the principal contradictions in your own society as you try for a radical transformation, your enemies will. And of course, the United States uh, under the Bush administration uh, had a, a, a passage in which it was in the so-called transition to democracy, as they saw it from the point of view of imperial the U.S., uh, was on the question of racial discrimination in, in Cuba. So African peoples, um, Afro descendants in Latin America who correlate with the most egregious indices of uh, lack of health and lack of education and uh, use of official violence against them and all of the downward uh, uh, indicators of, of uh, development must not just see themselves in their racial identity, but should tie their racial identity to a deeper humanism uh, that does not rid them of their racial histories, but does not limit them uh, to simply uh, trying to find some corner uh, within the nation that protects them against these historical ills. But actually, they stand forth uh, to take uh, a leadership uh, in those nations. And this point that you're making and to kind of, um, I guess, kind of ca uh, encapsulate this is, is the idea of constructing a society after liberation or the idea of what it looks like after struggle. We should be thinking about those particular, uh, you know, streams of thought simultaneously um, while struggling. And so this actually brings me to a question and you kind of you know, kind of uh, alluded to it or, or just prompted me to think about this as we were just listening to your response. Um, you know, this idea of the nation state and the of what to do next is, I mean, the, the defined nation state defined through a Western frame of reference or do a Eurocentric frame of reference um, is inherently racist. And then you made the, you, you made the point that, you know, constructing a society does not mean that you have to rid that racial history. But how do you build a society or construct a nation um, that is um, antithetical to a European construct or def definition of a nation state that you're having racial histories living in harm harmony towards each other because you mentioned humanism, this idea of constructing or situating, you know, um, having a, an advanced understanding or an expanded understanding of what, what the human being means. Well, here I would return to African liberation leaders um, who in uh, the particularities of, uh, of, in this case, sub-Saharan African um, identities and cultures fighting the imposition, uh, the socioeconomic and political and cultural imposition of Europe through colonialism, 
uh, actually through those particular fights raised some universal propositions, I think, of perhaps better than most of how to engage new perspectives about nationalism. Uh, we uh, should recall that Kwame Nkrumah um, uh, in, in Ghana in 57, Julius Nyeri uh, in, uh, in Tanzania talking about African socialism, drawing on the actual relations of production, uh, the actual human uh, humanistic relations of villages and communities to inform the contemporary or the modern society and that the new nation should be built in direct We are currently listening to a recent conversation with James Early where we are exploring Latin America and the pitfalls of national consciousness. James Early is a former director of cultural studies and communication at the Center for Folk Life Programs and Cultural Studies at Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Mr. Early has served in various positions at the Smithsonian Institution, including assistant provost for educational and cultural programs, assistant secretary for education and public service, deputy assistant secretary for public service, and executive assistant to the assistant secretary for public service. Prior to his work at the Smithsonian, Mr. Early was a humanist administrator at the National Endowment for the Humanities in Washington, D.C., a producer, writer, and host of 10 Minutes Left, a weekly radio segment of cultural, educational, and political interviews and commentary at WHUR-FM Radio at Howard University, and a research associate for programs and documentation. He currently serves on the board of the Institute for Policy Studies and is a consultant on various issues related to human rights, labor, land, and statecraft. Today's program was produced in solidarity with the native, indigenous, African, and Afro-descended communities that stand in Rock, Venezuela, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Brazil, Colombia, Kenya, or Grayson Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Palestine, South Africa, and Ghana, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Continue to enjoy the program. Uh, the actual human uh, humanistic relations of villages and communities to inf to inform the contemporary or the modern society and that the new nation should be built in direct collaboration to their needs and their practices, cutting out those things that um, would would not be beneficial uh, in the moment of transition. So it's not after liberation, it's through the liberation process already, trying to mirror what the new society would not be in actual social relations, b relationships between men and women, a relationship of the respect for the natural local economies rather than one size fits all, uh, the relationship of um, dealing with people owning and uh, developing the land in the interior rather than these large companies that then displace people and people uh, rush to try to find refuge in the big cities, uh, developing slums, trying to eke out a salary. I think the best example in the world where we're seeing that today is actually in Brazil, and it is with the movement of land of people. Over 400,000 uh, families to constitute over a million and some sorry, people probably now in their third or fourth generation, children having been born in that construct, they are the largest producers of organic rice uh, in Brazil, for example. Uh, so they are actually fighting politically, but they are producing by actually building new communities that you see where people are employed uh, from having taken over this land and making this land productive. Uh, they're able to build a more socially integrated movement in the movement of landless people, uh, even as they are engaged in looking at uh, systemically how to deal with the ultimate strictures of the state, which are which are against that. And we will we have already seen uh, leading up through Temer, uh, through the coup in Brazil prior to Bolsonaro being voted in attacks uh, on the organizers and murder of organizers. And unfortunately, I think we're going to see more violence directed against uh, these kinds of groupings. We're seeing on the continent of Africa, a similar movement of new socialist parties, of uh, popular progressive movements of, of women and youth uh, who are railing against the state that has been developed 
uh, coming out of the anti-colonial struggles. We're seeing it in South Africa, where the African National Congress has just uh, become uh, a caricature of what it was uh, now in its corruption, uh, in in the splits, in the fights among elites. And so we're seeing uh, new formations and in, in trade unions and, and new attempts at political organization. So it is working. And we even in the case of Cuba, which I will go back to, uh, if you listen to Diaz Canals, the new president of Cuba, who was born after the revolution, that is um, they're talking about participatory democracy. They are recognizing, I think, the limitations of centralism in parties, uh, which Fanon also talked about in the pitfalls of, of nationalism, of the limitations of a single party, which he said can become its own kind of dictatorship. And having to recognize that the strength, uh, in addition to the philosophical value of a new society, is to build directly in collaboration with the most marginalized, the most needy, because they not only have have wants and desires, they have ideas and creativity to participate in that process. And that is how over the long term, I think we get to see actual new constructs of nation building, not just philosophy about it. And that's important. And we're definitely going to situate um, Cuba in this conversation. But before we move there, what we understand about Venezuela in the context of all of this is very important. Probably, you know, I guess, in the context of the, the dominant discourse, there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding of what is happening in Venezuela in relation to everything that's going on in Latin America. Because, of course, you know, the Karen administration has targeted Venezuela as as problematic and there's a lot of destabilization that's going on. How does Venezuela fit into this particular conversation? Well, Venezuela, as we speak on the eve of um, a few days before Thanksgiving uh, 2018, is the main target of U.S. imperialism uh, in the Americas today. There is an open, vulgar discussion um, led by uh, right-wing Venezuelans who are tied into um, Marco Rubio, the Senate uh, in Miami, along with right-wing Cubans and tied to Steve Bannon uh, and John Bolton in the Trump White House. Uh, who are calling for uh, an invasion, openly calling for an invasion, openly calling for regime change uh, under the notion that there is a, humani a humanitarian imperative to go in. Um, and there is a, a, a crisis of, of um, a humanitarian crisis, in my view, inside Venezuela. Uh, significantly caused by the economic strangulation of uh, preventing the government access to the protocols of nations in dealing with its debt or dealing with new investments, uh, preventing the importation of medicines, uh, of uh, penalizing third countries. This is the extraterritorial arm of the U.S. empire uh, to set laws from this nation to punish any others in dealing with other nations that, that uh, ha have been targeted as enemies. Uh, the Bush administration, uh, the Trump administration, following up on the Obama administration, which said that Venezuela was a threat to U.S. security. Uh, the Trump administration is about to put Venezuela on the so-called terrorist list, which is sort of the ultimate pretext uh, for rationalizing uh, invasion. Why? Because Venezuela, uh, starting around 1999 with Hugo Chavez, right up through Maduro, the, uh, the present president of Venezuela, um, actually set off not just in another philosophical direction, a new world is possible, but actually organized that and put resources together uh, with Petrocarib, giving discount oil to the Caribbean, uh, oil to needy communities uh, in the U.S., it supported Cuba uh, in providing uh, medical assistance throughout Latin America. You see that Bolsonaro in Brazil has just um, uh, put out uh, several thousand uh, uh, more Cuban doctors who were working with the Pan American uh, Health Organization. Uh, one, for example, one um, province in Brazil uh, that's 75 percent of the people voted for Bolsonaro, but they just lost um, uh, 80, 60 percent of their doctors, 60, 60 out of 80 doctors uh, 
uh, were, were, were Cuban. So the attempt to overthrow Brazil, um, to take over its oil reserve, the largest oil reserve in the world, keeping in mind that it was, uh, of, of Venezuela, I mean, keeping in mind that Venezuela was the founder of the Organization of, Pro of Petroleum Producing Countries, OPEC, and plays a major role being uh, the largest oil reserve. So um, Venezuela is seen as the linchpin uh, contemporarily, both ideologically of seeking alternatives and through its uh, material resources, notwithstanding the the low price of oil and the restrictions um, the, that the economic war has placed on them, has been very supportive of Cuba. So John Bolton has come into the Trump White House, and they are targeting, uh, as they call the Troika, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, uh, and Nicaragua, who are, and we can anticipate that we will see intensified attacks on um, on Bolivia under and uh, Evo Morales. Now, what's the implication of this? We have to go beyond the analysis, and we here in the United States, uh, notwithstanding what we may think of socialism versus capitalism, uh, we have to ask ourselves some very fundamental ethical questions. Is war and invasion the answer? And of course it's not. Can we stand idly by while Trump says that, in effect, uh, let the Saudis continue to slaughter and to starve to death the, the Yemenis because they're going to buy hundreds of millions of dollars of arms to the United States uh, and which will provide jobs for the U.S. working class? Here is where we have to raise the ethical question. What kind of society, what kind of nation, what kind of nation building do we want? And fundamentally, those are ethical questions about a deep humanism, working with the least of us uh, to make sure that our nations are wholesome and stable and equal and just. And so the case of Venezuela is an urgent one. And again, uh, people must rally around no intervention, stop the economic strangulation, support the dialogue uh, between uh, the opposition who is peaceful, uh, who wants to talk with the government. And that becomes important because I wanted to push down and, you know, what has been the impact of Afro-Venezuelans on, on aggressive, clear, intentional, imperialistic uh, movements towards controlling and taking control of the state of Venezuela? Well, Afro-Venezuelans have been a key link uh, historically uh, since the uh, liberation of Gran Colombia, going way back into the 1800s. Uh, we must recall that uh, Simon Bolivar uh, went to this new free republic uh, in the Caribbean, which had been liberated by enslaved Africans, Haiti, and he asked for men and boats in order to start the revolutionary process against uh, European uh, colonialism uh, in Latin America. We must keep in mind that Venezuela is the first country to in, uh, in Latin America to defeat Spain, and that is intricately tied uh, to this relationship to Haiti, which jumping 100 years or so forward, uh, Hugo Chavez understood very clearly. That's why he began to say we owe a debt to Haiti. And in that context, uh, Afro-Venezuelans, Afro I keep saying Brazil, Afro-Venezuelans uh, played a, a historical role in just before Bolivar started his revolution of an anti-slave uh, revolt in Venezuela and where it not only called for anti-racist uh, policies and, and um, allowing the development of Afro-Venezuelans, it also called uh, for policies that would help other limited sectors in society. So the particularity of, of Afro-descendant liberation uh, in this hemisphere, and specifically talking about Brazil, always had a universality that came through our own existence, not something we were looking for as some abstract philosophy. But we were always about not only protecting and advancing ourselves, but by also looking to others who were needed. And as a result, Venezuelan, uh, Afro-Venezuelans uh, have overwhelmingly in each election since 1999 voted for the Bolivarian Revolution, both under the tutelage of the late Hugo Chavez as well, and, as, well as under uh, Maduro. And they continue to be a strong voice. And they have modeled something that Afro-descendants I've had great difficulty in other areas in Latin America, and I would say even here in the United States doing. Uh, you have Afro, uh, one Afro-Venezuelan uh, official who is a principal founder of the Afro-Venezuelan network, who both embraces the Bolivarian Revolution and criticizes it for its racist practices, calling certain ministers actually by name, and has been able to sustain that. 
we find ourselves in the United States, for example, you either supported the Obama administration outright and, and any criticism uh, was seen as, as anathema that you could not do that. Uh, they are modeled a way that we have to embrace progressive direction and at the same time criticize the limitations of those directions. Uh, blacks in Cuba have had a difficulty doing that, uh, embracing the revolution, but at the same time taking on uh, the failures uh, in the context of the advances around racial policies, but also taking on consistently and overtly uh, criticizing what the limitations are. We'll be getting to see more of that uh, in people like Esteban Morales Dominguez, 70 some years old, uh, Afro-Cuban communist, who recently in the last four months or so wrote a critical a criticism of Cuba's annual report to the UN to talk about race. And he says, you cannot talk abstractly about the, the nation and the Cuban revolution and simply how all Cubans have benefited. While that is generally true, and while Afro-Cubans in particular uh, have been chief beneficiaries or major beneficiaries of the revolutionary policies uh, in Cuba, the fact that we cannot index that, the fact that we have problems dealing with the notion of Afro-Cuban identity in the context of national identity means that we clearly do not understand the positive benefits of this revolution, nor do we understand its limitations and where public policies should be directed. Now, that is Afro descendancy, if you will, expressing through its own particularity a need to take a broader national view, but through our experience to inform where the nation goes, not just being a part of the nation or being subject to other leaders uh, within the, in, in the nation. And that dialectic or that developmental linkage between the history of a positive racial identity, because there are negative separatist racial identities among black people, absolute uh, anti-white skin or European identities among black people, but there are positive uh, Afro-descendant, uh, African uh, identities within the context of these nations where we look to advance ourselves and engaging the nation and its advancement in all sectors who might agree with those humanistic ideas. So uh, Afro-Venezuelans uh, have played and continue to play a key role. If you go to Barlavento, where they talk proudly about these, and they, and they call them socialist uh, cacao enterprises producing chocolates, these are large numbers of everyday people not just cadre of the Socialist Party of Venezuela. And it's appropriate that you mention in your response Cuba. Um, Cuba obviously is very important to understand a lot of what's going on, but also some of the advancements and some of the, the incubators of some of the advanced ideas of how to address a number of the inconsistencies and, and contradictory processes of democracy, freedom, and also how do you construct a nation state that is beneficial for everyone. How important is it for us to understand Cuba, including some of the recent developments in Cuba, to this to the conversation that we're having right now? Well, in a, you know, one way of looking at this is in a world of seven billion people, Cuba is this tiny speck, geographical speck of 11 million people, although it is the largest uh, republic in the Caribbean. Uh, it looms even larger in its humanistic philosophy and its practice. This little nation defied U.S. imperialism, said we will determine our own destiny, took power, changed the social relations of production in which uh, the um, surplus of production in the country went mostly to social needs of health, free health care, free education, the development of a extraordinary biotechnology industry, uh, and international sol uh, solidarity um, humanism that's really unparalleled of, of not only um, training thousands of doctors from all over the underdeveloped world and underdeveloped communities in the United States, black and brown communities in the United States, but also sending doctors, making agreements for health services were in some places they have had 20, 30,000 doctors. And in a place like Brazil, the sixth or seventh largest economy in the world, that does not provide for doctors in many of the interior areas. It's the Cubans who provided those doctors. Or in South Africa, the thousands of Cuban doctors in South Africa where many black South African doctors only want to be in Cape Town or Johannesburg or Durban, but don't want to serve 
uh, the interior where the masses of the population are. In fact, the South African Medical Association originally stood up against uh, these Cuban doctors, uh, as are the, sort of the bourgeois-oriented doctors in many of these underdeveloped countries. But they want to be in the areas that they can earn the most money and but not in the areas where their services are most needed. And so Cuba has been a stalwart of humanism in that regard. But the other side of Cuba is that the Cubans were held up as a paradise, both by their revolutionary leaders and by the fanfare of those of us um, in the various elements of the anti-imperialist, uh, anti-capitalist, pro-socialist perspectives are just pro-humanism. But the Cubans have come around to, uh, over the years, to a more somber view and demand that others engage their somber view of themselves. They're simply human beings like the rest of us, but the radical difference is that they dared to try and create a new society. And they're facing some of the contradictions. Um, Raul Castro, uh, who just recently uh, finished his second uh, legal uh, term as president and uh, a new president was elected, when he first was elected by the National Assembly, uh, he said that there was too little criticism in Cuba, and he called for more criticism to better the revolution. Uh, he said to the Communist Party that the Communist Party is indispensable in the direction and the security of the country, but he was very clear with the Communist Party that the Communist Party is not the citizenry and it is not the government, and that uh, we been, then began to see a more pronounced discourse that you must listen to the people. You hear that a lot from this new president, Diaz Canals in Cuba. You must listen to the people. You must seek their ideas of where they think there are problems or where they think there are new resolutions that may, must be uh, uh, pursued. This is a form formalization of a participatory democracy, which has always been germinating in the the consistent consultations between the party, the government, and mass organizations, but they're trying to take it to another step because they recognize that ultimately democracy must turn on the active citizenry, not simply around a party or a government. So uh, this self-reflection, this self-criticism that is going on in Cuba, which if you read Spanish and you can find it in some, some English writings of, of citizens who live in Cuba, who want to live in Cuba, who want to live in socialist Cuba, some of them are socialist, some of them are not, but they hold up their virtues. And in that context, they're increasingly talking about their own limitations. And I'll conclude on that point, because uh, again, Raul Castro, I think, uh, concentrated the sharpness of this of this issue uh, of self-reflection of how to build and continue to build a, a, a new nation. He said that the embargo is really strangling them. But if the embargo were removed tomorrow, the question of the survival of that revolution would still be in question because of their own failures, their own errors. That is refreshing that a proud country, which has contributed so much to its own internal development and to the rest of the world, can look squarely in the mirror and honestly say to itself, we must deal with our own limitations, our own failures. He has hit the issue of corruption very hard, which the left in the United States seldom ever mentions, uh, that Cuba has a big corruption problem uh, in the context of all this humanistic expression and policies and contributions to uh, solidarity around the world it's, it's made. So this is refreshing to see a country look boldly at itself. And this is a part of looking at new constructions uh, of the of the nation. And then as we conclude this conversation, because we can go on and I want to be mindful of your time. Um, in this conversation, we have jumped back and forth with continents. We move through countries that have large populations of African descended people, obviously, in, in Latin America. But trying to contextualize a look deeply at the histories and the so-called global rise of the ultra right and this discourse around nationalism. What are some concluding comments that you think that are important for our, um, our listeners to take away? from this conversation that we have had, which is a very, very broad conversation. And I intentionally wanted to do that because I wanted to have enough there that can generate other discussions, whether it's in um, people organizing themselves in their communities, whether there are, are scholars and teachers that are trying to teach on this particular topic in their classrooms, or whether families want to have conversations. So I wanted to make sure that there was enough here that can be taken away. What are some of the things that you think in concluding, what are some of the ideas ideas in, in relation to Fanon, framing this understanding of what we call um, a nationalism, as he would also say, the pitfalls of a, of a national consciousness. But what are some of the 
concluding ideas that you think our listeners should take away from this conversation today? Well, for me, a fundamental point about Fanon is still um, really imperative for us to always frame our lives. Where are we and what are we doing in relationship to the most needy in our society and in relationship to their capacity to actualize themselves, however limited we may think their understanding is or however limited we may think their projects are. But if we look at that in all seriousness, uh, that that is the index of where justice must go. That is the index of what democracy should be. And meaning democracy, the participation of an active citizenry, collaborating with them is the fundamental thing in shaping uh, policies and shaping communities and shaping families and shaping uh, a nation. Uh, working with the most uh, aggrieved. That has put, been put in class terms, and class is a fundamental proposition of, uh, of, of the economics uh, that have caused all of these problems. Uh, but class has always been racialized uh, in our hemisphere. It has always been genderized as well, but it was around race that it rationalized the dehumanization and the super exploitation of people. And we're living with that legacy today. So those of us who have had the benefit of more education, of more income, of more material circumstance, the, when we look at a question, a policy issue, we should ask ourselves, is it in the interest of the most marginalized, not just is, is it in my class interest? And how do I take the benefits of, of my initiative or my family's initiative uh, to collaborate with with those communities, those the most marginalized and those outcasts. The Fanon was very, very explicit about that. But finally, I would put it on a larger level as we see how politics, the struggle over power, is actually being played out today as we talk. There is a very conscious movement of right-wing ideologues and organizers in racist dimensions of societies across Europe and across the Americas and inside the United States who are aligning themselves with very conscious party formations who are anti-immigrant, which is a highly racialized issue. And in a recent uh, meeting with Bernie Sanders um, and some people from the Center for Economic Policy Research and Danny Glover and I talking about some issues in Latin America, uh, I made note of this uh, about this international phenomena, which is not my discovery. Many other people are talking about it. And Bernie Sanders says, yeah, I said, what we need is to begin to build an international uh, progressive front to confront uh, the, this right wing uh, phenomena that we're seeing across the globe. And with you know, a few weeks Later or so, I saw an article that did not come from our conversation. I think it had already been in process. And this is not about highlighting Bernie Sanders, per se, but it's, a, it's about where some of these discussions are going on, where he, too, is calling for an international progressive front. And so from our vantage points of solidarity, we have got to build horizontally. We cannot just be a black community in and of ourselves, for example, saying, well, what is our own individual interest up against other interests? But what is our own individual interest in relationship to other interests? And how do we go about, people call it intersectionality, uh, about this collaboration of uh, building these coalitions? Because uh, these people are not playing. Uh, the right wing, in the case of the United States, uh, has deconstructed, uh, taken back, uh, all of the gain, most of the gains from that we achieved in breaking U.S. apartheid, and we see it in the case of uh, Brazil. Uh, they are taking back uh, the democracy that was won coming out of the dictatorship, and they're being violent about it, and they're threatening to use arms about it, uh, so that whoever is listening out there, we've got to be, move beyond a narrow self-interested perspective, re putting our self-interest in the context of interest of others. Uh, who are struggling. And that's the measurement of uh, what uh, justice um, possibilities are at this point. Otherwise, we'll be picked off one by one. And we are seeing, you know, we're seeing many in the Jewish community uh, who have supported uh, Donald Trump, uh, who now and, and Netanyahu, and who are saying that um, anti-Semitism is very fundamental uh, to these fascist um, uh, movements. Um, we have to get beyond personality discussions, you know, these pictures of 
Michelle Obama and George Bush, uh, with all of the positive attributes that she brings as a role model, we cannot let that obscure the fact that this is the man who started uh, the war in um, uh, um, Iraq. Um, this is um, a man who has not spoken out against uh, the right wing policies of uh, the Republican Party, uh, who did not take on Sessions and these people. Well, so we've got to be really, really clear eyed, clear -eyed about uh, what actually is going on um, that is threatening the quality of our lives and actually taking our lives and organize across groups, always maintaining the interest of black and black advancement, um, but in coalition with others. We have been in conversation with James Early, one of the 21st century most important activists, thinkers, scholars, teachers, cultural workers, someone who has highly influenced my own trajectory up close and, and from afar. Thank you for taking the time to um, talk with us today, James Early. Uh, thank you. See you on the battle lines. That's it for Africa World Now Project for this week. I would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week. We can be reached through all your regular social media platforms. Email Project at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at AFWRLDNWPRJ. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. The Africa World Now Project Collective consists of international media journalist, executive producer, and human rights activist Mwizu Mutali, Africa World Now Project media correspondent Funda Ngunda, senior research, content contributor, and production director Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui, senior researcher and content contributor and production associate Dr. Josh Myers, associate producer and content contributor Dr. Keisha Khan Perry, technology advisor is Byron Gray of Grayworks Technology, and creative director is Judah Pope. Africa World Now Project is heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC NPR affiliate and broadcasting service of Winston-Salem State University. Shows are archived weekly on SoundCloud. Search Africa World Now Project. Until next week, be safe, be peaceful, and above all, be intelligent. I'm a bit too dangerous. If you want me, you should just.